Well, good morning and welcome to the second of our sessions on um, using findings. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr Donna Cohen. Um, Donna is Director of Meerkat Proprietary Limited. She's over 25 years of experience in research, project design, implementation and evaluation, policy development and stakeholder engagement in the higher education and health services sectors. Over the last nine years, she's been a major contributor to the redesign of the Victorian clinical education system through which tomorrow's health workforce gains practical experience, skills and knowledge. She's also developed and implemented evaluation frameworks for a range of Victorian programs and through this work she's been designing new ways of applying evaluation methodologies to organisational self-assessment and quality improvement activities. Um, and her talk today is on MAP-enabled experiential review, enhancing the relevance of education <coughs> and evaluation at the program review conference. So I'll hand over to Donna. Thank you very much, Donna. Thank you very much, Lynn. And thank you to the organisers for the opportunity to present this year's conference. So uh, my presentation today, as Lynn said, is on a technique that we have been uh, developing and working with for the last few years, which we call MAP Enabled Experiential Review, or MIR for short, that's the MIR in Meerkat. Uh, this is a technique that can be used in the context of program evaluation or quality improvement activities more broadly. And today I'm going to be showing you how the use of this technique in the context of a multi-site program evaluation uh, created a more holistic outcome for the evaluation and also very importantly helped to make the evaluation much more relevant to the people working at the coalface of program delivery. So in my presentation today I'm going to be uh, talking about why it was we started looking for some different approaches to evaluation, then show you what MIA is and how it works, I'll take you through a case study and then finally just talk about some of the scenarios in which we can see this approach being applied. So we've been working in the quality space for probably the last two decades, but we didn't create our first evaluation framework until about eight or nine years ago. When you start working uh, in developing evaluation frameworks, you learn this very important point, that indicators are the centerpiece of an evaluation framework. But when you start using an evaluation framework for the first time, or trying to analyze the data that comes from an evaluation, you realize there are two very important caveats. The first is, of course, that not everything that's important about a program can actually be measured through an indicator. And the second is sort of the flip side of this, which is that not everything that you can measure with an indicator is necessarily all that important about the program. And so the problem is if you are relying almost exclusively on indicator measures for your evaluation, you can end up with a very um, unbalanced and incomplete view of how well the program is actually working at the coalface. And it was with this in mind that we started to look for some approaches that could complement and supplement what we were doing with indicators to produce a more holistic uh, evaluation outcome. And that's the context in which we developed the MIR or Map Enabled Experiential Review approach. And basically what MIR is, is an assessment, as I say, usually conducted in the context of quality improvement or evaluation, an assessment that is mediated by an interactive graphical representation of whatever it is that's being assessed. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I see the words graphical representation of a program, I always think program logic map, and indeed that is the basis of the mere approach. So I'm sure that most people in this room would be very familiar with program logic maps, and you know that they are an excellent model of how a program is expected to work. Uh, it does this by describing the relationships between all of the component parts, and of course, revealing the assumptions that we've made about how the system is expected to work. Now, there are really two main groups of people who use this model. Uh, the first are the program managers, and they will use this for the purposes of program planning, because of course, they know what the inputs are supposed to be, they know what the activities are supposed to be, and so on. The other group, of course, that use program logic models is us, program evaluators. And uh, we usually do this for the purposes of identifying the evaluation questions, and the indicators through which those questions will be addressed. But it occurred to me when I first built my first program logic model that I put an awful lot of work into designing that model. There's a lot of IP, there's a lot of intel about the program that goes into that model. And I thought, well, you know, if this is how we think it's supposed to work, then surely one of the questions we would be asking during the evaluation is, 
And did it work that way? Is that what actually ended up happening? In other words, that we would then use that logic model as actually a tool in the context of the evaluation. The problem is that until recently, the software that exists for drawing program logic models basically creates an inert model. It lies on a page and looks at you. And when you finish identifying your evaluation questions and your indicators, you put it away in a drawer and you never look at it again. Or if you're really lucky, you might hang it up on the wall and go, look at my program logic model, but you actually never do. So we realized that if we wanted to use our logic models in the context of conducting an evaluation, we needed something that allowed us to convert them into interactive tools. And since that software didn't exist, we made it ourselves, and that's what Meerkat is. It's a tool that converts your logic model into an interactive data collection tool. So this is a logic model that's been drawn in the Meerkat application, and uh, the detail of this is not particularly important, uh, but I'll just point out some, some features here. First of all, this is not actually a program. Uh, this is a map actually for a National Safety and Quality Health Service Standard for False Prevention and Management, and the Meerkat application allows you to draw anything that you want in it. Uh, but each of those nodes in the map, you can see that there's, um, there's a, a legend there showing what all the color coding means. So each of those color coded nodes represents an input, a process, an output, an outcome, an objective, and so on. Uh, and what ha would happen is that this model would be projected up on the wall and a team would be sitting around talking about this model. And when they click on one of the nodes, it opens up a dialog box. And I'll show you that now in a bit more detail. So this dialog box shows you that it's a process, it tells you the name of the process. There's a little question mark in the lower left-hand corner there. When you click on that, uh, up comes some information about the node, including a rating question. And you can see that there's a rating scale there. And it's actually a clickable interface. So as the group is sitting around talking about this, and as the different members of the team are talking about how they are personally experiencing this aspect of the system, they can click on, the, on that particular rating bar. And, and you can register all of the rates, rating of all of the members of the team. You can also actually uh, add some comments and attach some documents, which provides a further evidence base supporting the rating of the node. Then when they click on the next button, they discuss what the consensus rating is that they want to give for that particular node. Uh, and then finally, in the last screen, they get a summary of the individual team ratings, the consensus that they agreed on. And then at the bottom there, the tool makes a recommendation about whether they might include this in a quality improvement action plan. Because, of course, there's no point in identifying a problem unless you're actually going to do something about it. I'm not going to talk about the action planning functionality, just suffice it to say that it does exist. But what I want to point out is that when they click on the Done button, they get a little icon in the top right-hand corner of the node, which indicates, in this case, it's a little orange hazard warning that indicates that the, the uh, consensus rating was an average or below average rating. If they rated it above average, they get a little purple tick. And here are all my purple ticks. And you can see that when all of the nodes in the map have been rated, you have something of an instant snapshot of where the problem areas exist. So basically, this is what MIR is, Map-Enabled Experiential Review. The map enables a structured conversation amongst a group about all of the various different aspects of the program or process or project, whatever it is that's being, being assessed. Um, and it allows the group to, to talk about their experiences of the system and for that to be captured as part of the evaluation or assessment. So what I want to do now is tell you about how we've actually used this technique in the context of a program evaluation. And the particular program is the Rural Community Intern Training Program, which is run by the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services at five program sites in regional Victoria. Now, this program is targeted to medical interns. So these are people who've completed their university education in medicine, and then they have a compulsory one-year internship they have to complete. This particular program is focused on getting medical practitioners into rural and regional areas. And so uh, the interns are based at a regional or rural hospital, and they undertake a compulsory 20-week uh, rotation into a community setting, usually general practice clinic. So that's the program. Back in 2015, uh, we won the contract to develop their evaluation framework. And working with stakeholders across the five program sites, we came up with a logic model. Uh, this allowed us to identify 17 evaluation questions uh, across the five program objectives, and that drilled down into 30 indicators, with 21 of them 
identified as high priority indicators, meaning that we thought we could collect reliable high quality data, that we could interpret the data without too many confounding issues, and that importantly the sites would be able to do something, they'd be able to action the, the indicator results. So this actually is the logic model that we developed, and uh, for those of you who've ever used DoView, you'll recognize this is a model created in DoView. This model goes from left to right, in yellow on the far side are the inputs, the orange ones are the activities, the green ones are outputs, and the blue ones over here are outcomes, and then the five program objectives in pink. And here are the 30 indicators aligned against the nodes in the map. Now you'll note that most of the indicators align against outcomes and objectives. Uh, that's very deliberate. Uh, in the spirit of, of modern indicator warfare, we know that you have to have an outcomes focus to your indicators, even when they are structural and process uh, indicators. And so they'll all align directly or indirectly, or most of them anyway, will align directly or indirectly with outcomes and objectives. But if you look at the body, the, the guts of the model, which is actually the guts of the program, you can see that the indicator alignment is much more sparse. Again, this is a little bit deliberate. We don't believe in coming up with indicators just for the sake of measuring something. We actually want indicators that are going to tell you something valuable about the system, if you can, if you can possibly identify those. Uh, but what that means, of course, is that there are large parts of the model where there is no really good indicator to measure what's going on there. And that's not unusual for a logic model. So in between the time when we developed this in 2015 uh, and when we won the contract to actually conduct the evaluation in 2016, we had developed our Meerkat tool. And we thought, well, for this evaluation, instead of just relying on the indicators, which are going to tell really not a very complete story about this program, why don't we use the, the Meer approach to supplement that? So what we did was to convert this logic model into a Meerkat tool, as shown here. Now in Meerkat, you actually don't see the indicators uh, aligned in this way. I've just drawn them there just to show you that alignment. Uh, and um, what you do when you're setting up your model for each of those nodes is you create what we call back-end content, which is to set up a rating scale and to put the information into the system so that you can actually use it as a data collection tool. So we did that for all 75 of the, of the rateable nodes in this, in this map. So in terms of our methodology, obviously we were collecting data against the indicators. We used all the usual suspects, a stakeholder survey, report pro forma to collect factual information from the programs about how they were actually implementing the program at their site, as well as de-identified data from statewide databases on intern outcomes. In terms of the MIR assessment, this was going to be done as a team-based assessment, and we were going to conduct sessions with groups of stakeholders at each of the five program sites, and then do some follow-up action planning with the program administrators, and then obviously data analysis and reporting. Now there are three cycles of evaluation as part of this project. The first one goes through all of this process. The second one being done later this year is just having a look at some indicators, and then the final um, evaluation late next year will repeat the whole process. Now just, I just want to come back and tell you a little bit more about how this assessment using MIR was, was, uh, was being done. Our original intention was to go out to the five program sites and get together a whole big group of, of stakeholders, and there are three main subgroups, get them all together in a room and have them all sit down as we work through for two and a half to three hours the 75 rateable nodes. Just one problem, most of the stakeholders are medical practitioners and we were very unlikely to get them in the room for more than a 20 minute consultation, never mind a two and a half to three hour um, discussion session. So we decided what we should do is actually break this map up and look with different stakeholder groups at the different nodes that were of relevance to them. So these are the nodes that are particularly relevant to the program administrators and senior managers. These are the nodes that are relevant to the supervisors, medical educators and mentors, and these are the nodes that are relevant to the interns. And you can see that some of the nodes are relevant to all of the groups, and some of them are relevant to only one or two of the groups. So what we did was go to each program site, conduct multiple meetings, and gradually come up with a compilation of ratings of nodes right across the whole, the whole of the logic model. And this is an example from one of the five program sites of what the finished product looked like. I'm not going to go into the detail here, but just suffice it to say that when you first look at that, your image, would, your impression would be that um, the majority of the nodes are actually got the little purple tick, and in fact that was the case. Two thirds of the nodes were positively rated, and that was pretty much what we saw right across the board. 
But of course, we were interested to say, well, how did the consensus ratings from each of the five program sites vary across all of these, uh, across all of these nodes? And I'll show you an excerpt of the report that we ran to do this comparison. So what you're actually looking at here, again, don't worry about the detail of the individual um, nodes. This is just 12 of the 75 nodes. And uh, what you can see is that each program is represented by a little circle. That circle represents its program's consensus rating for that particular node. So the programs are listed as A, B, C, D, and E. If it's a green circle, it means that their consensus rating was above average. A blue circle means it was the average node rating, uh, consensus rating. And an orange circle means that it was below average. You'll also see that each of the nodes has its own unique rating scale. So some nodes have only a two point rating scale, some have three, some have four, some have five. Uh, you'll also notice that for most of the nodes, there's quite a variation from one program to the next about how they actually rated themselves. And it was not always the case that program A rated themselves very well on every node and program E rated themselves poorly. Sometimes it was you know, one way and sometimes it was the other way. But this was a really valuable piece of information to give back to the department for them to be able to see what was a local issue and what is actually a global issue. But we were also interested to see how these consensus ratings created an overall consensus for the whole program across the five sites. So we took these data and we mapped it back onto the map itself. So this is now, if you like, the consensus of consensuses across the whole program. And while it looks a little bit random, there are actually three discrete regions of issues that were identified, which are shown here with the boxes. So the blue box at the top there, that is around a collection of issues that are all to do with the same thing, which is the training and support issues for supervisors, medical ed educators, and mentors. Then there are five issues boxed in red at the bottom there, and those are all intern orientation and support issues. And then there are four issues that we call program admin issues. You'll also see that there are two orange um, hazard marks over here in the outcomes and two in the objectives. Now, this is not surprising. If you've got issues in the guts of your program, they're probably going to translate into issues in your outcomes and objectives. But what I want to show you is how this aligned against the indicators. Because, of course, at the same time, we were collecting data against indicators. This is the list of indicators that we were collecting data against as well as, um, oh, I should just point out, we only ended up monitoring 19 of the 21 uh, high priority indicators because we couldn't collect data at that time for two of the indicators. As well as tabulating the data and graphing it, we also developed a traffic light system for indicating, for showing whether the indicator results were high performance, or superior performance, moderate performance, or low level performance. And this is how those 19 indicators came up. You can see that 15 of the 19 were superior performance. It wasn't borderline, it was like truly superior performance. And then we had four indicators that were moderate level performance. I want you to particularly pay attention to these five indicators, two, three, four, five, six, all of which you can see were superior performance, and indicators 17 and 18, which are moderate level performance. And I want to show you how these map onto the map. So here's indicator two, two. You can see it's over there. This was one of the superior performance ones. Indicator two asked uh, stakeholders about their level of satisfaction with the resourcing of the program. And that got a big thumbs up from each of the five program sites, very satisfied. But when we got in and had these conversations and started talking about funding, they didn't identify an issue right now, but they could see that there were going to be issues because there wasn't going to be enough funding for them to expand what they were doing, take on more interns, do different activities. So it got a little orange hazard mark on the map, even though the indicator told us that everything was A-OK. -okay. This is indicators three, four, five, and six. These were also superior performance. These relate to retention rates of host sites, supervisors, medical educators, and mentors. But when we got in and we started talking to the medical educators, mentors, and supervisors, they told us, training, what training? Support, mm, not so sure about that. Of course, it's too early in the program for you to see the readout in retention rates. These are going to be issues that are going to play out in two, three, four years' time. Then your indicator will fall off a cliff and your retention rates will go down. But for now, the indicator told you everything's fine, nearly 100% retention. But when you talk to people about the underlying issues, they're actually telling you that there's something that you need to be aware of. 
The other indicators I pointed out to you were 17 and 18. These were the two indicators that had a moderate um, level of performance, and these are actually mapping against uh, an objective that also showed that there was an issue. Now, these indicators relate to retention rates of indicators after they complete their internship, and uh, they're actually aligning against an objective which is for a sustainable pipeline of rural practitioners. So here we were seeing good alignment between the indicator and what we were seeing in the mere analysis. So uh, I guess this sort of brings me to, to the, the guts of this, which is what was the value that Mia added into, into this evaluation. And the first, of course, is that we got a much more holistic evaluation outcome than we would have had if we had only relied on the indicator measures. And that's because we were able to assess aspects of the, of the program that were not particularly amenable to indicator measures. And even where there were indicator measures, um, there the, there were actually issues that came up that we that were flagged that we didn't see as a result of the of the indicators. The second major uh, um, thing that was added value that was added was that we were conducting structured conversations at each of the five program sites, and it was a similar conversation, and that allowed us to do that comparison report and identify what is a local issue that needs local solutions as opposed to a global issue in the program that requires more global solutions. There's another aspect to this particular, this particular part of value, which is, of course, they're going to come back and repeat this assessment at the end of next year, and they'll be able to run a report where they compare their assessment at the end of 2018 to the assessment they ran at the beginning of 2017 and see whether there's been any improvement during that period of time. And that really leads me to the next piece of value that Mia added into this, which is that I mentioned that there's a, an action planning tool there. And so, of course, the assessment outcomes are feeding directly into a quality improvement action plan. And in a formative assessment, quality improvement is a key aspect of what you're conducting that evaluation for. And so this is a very useful thing to, to be contributing. The last um, piece of value that was added was that the stakeholders were actually talking about aspects of the program that were directly relevant to them. So if I'm a supervisor in this program, to be honest with you, I'm not thinking of it from the point of view of the overall retention rates of supervisors. I'm thinking it from the point of view of, am I getting the training I need? Am I getting the support I need to conduct my particular role in this program? The program admin cares about retention rates, but I don't as an individual. So they're actually talking about issues that matter to them, and they're seeing those issues being reflected in the evaluation outcomes. Uh, the other thing is that when we put those maps up on the wall, the stakeholders actually became educated about what was going on in the program. They didn't really realize how everything fit together and was supposed to work. So it was an educative process. And as a result of them listening to other stakeholders talking about how they experienced the system, they learned from each other in that process as well. So finally, um, just in terms of the applications of this, well, using our, our Meerkat software, you can, in fact, turn any program logic, um, any process map, any theory of change model into an interactive data collection tool and use it in the context of actually conducting your assessment or evaluation. I've shown you here how you can use this to evaluate program implementation. But you could take that same logic model created in Meerkat with a different rating scale, and you could suddenly turn it into something to assess whether a site is actually ready for program implementation. Or with a different rating scale, you could assess whether you, you could actually track your implementation during program rollout, or indeed compare the implementation between program sites. It all depends on the rating scale that you put into those nodes. Uh, we've also used it by creating maps against standards and frameworks, and people, self, organizations self-assess the, themselves against that. And similarly, we've created models for business processes, and organizations self-assess themselves for that. So finally, I'd just like to acknowledge that this program evaluation was funded by the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services, and our partners in developing Meerkat are Common Code. We do have a trade booth here if anyone wants to see a bit more about how to use this tool. Thank you. Donna, that was very inspiring.